I'm going to sit down to do this today for several different reasons. One, uh, and most important, because I can't see. So that's a bad way to be, right? I had uh, eye surgery on Wednesday. I wasn't all worried about the eye surgery. There's a membrane that was left over. You know, I was in Kenya in February and my retina detached. I was a long way from the doctor's office that I go to in Plano, so I had to beat a path back uh, through about 36 hours of travel by myself to get back to, to Plano and get that taken care of. And, but it left behind this membrane in my eye that was leaving a pretty good distortion. It wasn't going to get better, and so we did surgery to take off the membrane. So that's how they've been selling it to me. And then I, got, I filled out my online stuff about the procedure, and there's a medical term for it. But it's not a long, complicated medical-sounding term. The name of the procedure that I went through on Wednesday, it turns out, is called an eyeball peel. I t they asked me, so do you have any concerns? I said, not until I saw what you're calling this. Now I'm very concerned. It sounds horrible. And anyway, so I did that. So my depth perception is not great. Uh, and uh, I decided I'd rather not do a half gainer off the top of top of the board here and land in there in somebody's lap. So I'm going from, this, I'm going from the chair. Now, uh, here's the other part of this. I was talking to Jimmy Smith about this before he left for Guatemala. That uh, The other part is, so I'm talking about really hard things. Meanwhile, I have this right eye that I can barely see out of. It's very, still pretty uncomfortable. So I said, there's n Jimmy, do you think there'll be anything weird uh, or creepy about preaching a sermon on this topic like this. So anyway, we're talking about <laughs> pornography uh, and winking at you the whole service. So if uh, my eyes open and close and it's not for that purpose, it is because I had surgery on Wednesday, all right? Oh, yeah, you don't want to miss this one, right? This is going to be good. All right, Proverbs 5 is where I'd like for you to open up. And I have some numbers for you. And I know statistical things can be overwhelming, but I think these are important for this particular topic. And so, first number I want to put up, 4.6. And here's what that stands for. 4.6 billion hours of pornography on just the number one pornography site on the internet. On the one big site. 4.6 billion hours. Just to Factor that out, that's 524 years of pornography for one life, for one person, or around 17,000 complete lifetimes spent watching pornography online. And that's just the one biggest site for uh, distribution of uh, hardcore pornography on the internet. And it just, that just tells us this is an epidemic in our land. This isn't a small issue, it's a big issue. And that's why we're taking on hard things today. Next number is 11. This one is maybe the most troubling out of the whole set. At age 11, the average child has already been exposed, exposed to explicit pornographic content. I'm not talking about nudity. I'm talking about video of sexual acts in progress. Average age, a child is exposed to hardcore pornography, explicit pornography. They are 11 years old. 93% of boys, 62% of girls are exposed to internet pornography during their adolescent years. And among those under the age of 18 who regularly consume pornographic content, 22% of them are under the age of 10 years. Uh, you know, we used to talk about this topic and say, well, man, I hope the youth minister addresses this. By the time they get to student ministry, I mean, we, we let your grade schoolers not be in here. But this is, this is something for, for grade schoolers. They're being exposed at a high level at a very early age, and it is leaving some terrible 
terrible uh, carnage out there in the lives of children. 70% of teens, and, and this is, by the way, all this is from two studies that came out in the last two years, big kind of comprehensive studies on this, on this topic. So this is fresh. 70% of teens and young adults define porn by its function, not its form. 70%. Now, young adults was the focus of one of the main studies. It was, it was a big study uh, and, and very detailed. But this is true pretty much across age groups, they found. 70% say by its, by its function, not its form. Here's what that means. It's pornography if it's just pornography. But if it's in the context of your favorite movie, streaming TV show, it's not so much pornography anymore. It's art. And folks stop calling it pornography when it's on Netflix because it's in the context of a story. Do you see how that works? How a lot of things start being embraced that should not be embraced. The danger of these things. As long as it's part of the story. It's not pornography. 57. 57% 57 of young adults admit to seeking out porn at least once a month. Now here's the thing about any kind of survey like this in our country. We way underestimate our badness. We way overestimate our goodness in any survey like this. But 57% of young adults are willing to say, yeah, at least once a month which means it's dramatically bigger than that in its actual number. 49%, this is interesting because these people who do surveys, they have to figure out words are so important and the information you get in a survey. That's why a lot of surveys, we look at political surveys and all that, the words that they use so uh, uh, poison the content of, of, the, of the research. So here's what they, they figured out. If we're going to get real good information, we have to ask the question differently. So here's how they asked these young adults. So, do your friends use pornography on a regular basis? Yeah, not you, but do your friends use pornography on a regular basis? 49% of young adults said that most or all of their friends use pornography on a regular basis. Most or all of their friends use pornography on a regular basis. The significance is that it's, it's, uh, porn use is rampant across age categories. It's particularly pronounced among young adults. 96, 96% 96 of young adults are encouraging, accepting, or neutral in their view toward, uh, toward uh, pornography. So that leaves just this tiny group of people who think there's anything wrong with this, that there's any negative at all. When they ask young adults, so, and by the way, Again, I say young adults, man, this is, this is epidemic through our oldest adults in our, in our nation. So this is not a, not, not a hidden away thing. But only one out of 20 young adults say their friends consider pornography to be a bad thing. One out of 20. 61. 61% of pornography is watched on a mobile phone. And in America, that, that's worldwide, in America it's... It's over 70% watched on a mobile device, which means it's just always available and uh, accessible, affordable, and uh, fairly anonymous. This is the, uh, this is the other danger, is that uh, we have phones, we have tablets, we have computers, but those phones and tablets, they're with us all the time, and uh, they make an excellent babysitter. But three mouse clicks, and again, your grade schooler is in the darkest part uh, of a uh, pornographic world. And so that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, the big dangers we need to keep in mind in relationship to where pornography is consumed. 33, 33% of women aged 25 and under go searching for porn at least once a month. 56%, this is them self-reporting, 56% of women in that age group have gone looking for it at least one time in the past uh, compared to 27% of those 25 or older. What we're finding nationally is that this is not, we used to talk about pornography almost as, okay, women, you can leave the room and now we're just going to talk to the guys. But pornography is, is an ever-increasing women's issue in our country. 62 62% of teens and young adults have received explicit, sexually explicit images, sexually explicit images 
on their mobile device. 41% have sent one. It's usually a boyfriend sending something to a girlfriend. Oh, we love each other so much, and they're so immature that they think that's never going to go anywhere except to the boyfriend or girlfriend. This is the sexting, uh, you're familiar with that terminology, uh, but young folks are using digital devices to trade in self-porn. 80. 80% 80 of porn, porn users feel no sense of guilt when using pornography. And here's what we know about sin. We know that any sin repeated dulls the conscience, uh, sears our sensibilities, and before long, you just don't feel it anymore, hardened. Pornography is available, common, celebrated, widely used, and uh, so much in our nation at so many different levels. And this is just one of the big ones. We have lost our inner sense of what's right and wrong. Uh, why are the things we see, and again, in print media, television, movies, uh, the internet, why are they so dangerous? The things we see. Well, Jesus said in the great, in the, uh, Sermon on the Mount. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So much of temptation enters through the eyes. The oldest book in the Bible uh, is probably Job. First, first book to be written down. There was a long oral history before, before Moses wrote down uh, things related to the patriarchs, your Abraham, Isaac, Jacob stories. Job's a contemporary of Abraham. His story goes way, way back. And in that book, in Job 31, 1, Job says, He made a covenant with God concerning his eyes that he would not look with lust on a woman. Job knew the temptation enters through the door of our eyesight. We see it with Eve. Eve experienced it in the Garden of Eden. You remember, she sees the fruit. She sees the fruit, and the temptation begins, and a thought process starts following what she has observed when she looks on it and desires it. So here is this lethal serpent because it's available with a phone, with a tablet, with a computer, and again, 24-hour accessibility, anonymity, affordability, protected privacy, and it is everywhere. There's an organization called Every Man's Battle. There's a version of this for women as well. There's bo there are books by those titles that are available. That it's, it would, it's good for everybody to read these books and to learn just some basic ways to avoid temptation, to be encouraged out of uh, the addiction to uh, sexually explicit images. But in, uh, this comes, a, a guy, his name is Wallace. He's a frequent traveler. A lot of folks travel regularly with business. And he said, he came to dread hotels. And this is the quote. I always eat a long leisurely supper, stalling before returning to my room because I know what's coming. Before too long, I have the TV remote in my hand. I tell myself it'll only be for a minute, but I know I'm lying. I know what I really want. I'm hoping to catch a little sex scene or two as I search the channels. I tell myself that I'll only watch for a while or that I'll stop before I get too carried away. But then it's on to pay-per-view movies. The temptations may have taken on a different look, but the temptations are the same. We are aware of Satan's schemes, God's Word says. We shouldn't be surprised by how he does things. He hasn't changed his strategy dramatically in all these years. And so, Satan uses sex. And this is why we're doing this in the context of a series on the family. Satan uses sex outside of his plan to destroy lives, to destroy marriages, to blow up families. And he's doing it all the time. I want to read, I don't know often, uh, we didn't have a children's sermon today, have a little, little bit of extra time. I'm going to read a whole chapter from Proverbs chapter 5. Now, this is a book of great wisdom. Solomon is laying down some big stuff in Proverbs. and This one is uh, almost a parable, uh, an illustration, as it tells about this young man. And here's what it says. Proverbs 5, verse 1. Everybody still breathing out there? Okay. My son, 
Be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. This is the temptress. Her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wonder. She does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, from the temptation. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give her your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Here's his advice. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not the strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. Because of his great folly, he is led astray. As an outline of your program today, some things to, to note from this passage in Proverbs, which is an excellent passage on this particular topic. And here's the first thing, just to, to re, and this isn't the only time in Proverbs even, the Bible hits this. Proverbs 7 has something about it too. First, realize the dangers. Sometimes we're just oblivious to the fact that there is great danger. The writer of Proverbs gave the warning in Proverbs 7, For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple. I perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner. See, this is instead of staying away from her door, instead he's drifting that way. Uh, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Oh, how we love the darkness. And behold, a woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. Television is a fascinating thing. A trends in television. And there, there are shows that have been on now for years. Uh, others come and go, but... Reality television is a weird aberration in our world, and reality television is filled with reality shows that have a strong sexual content theme to them. Uh, it's about relationships. We're always fascinated by relationships. But you start having a show about relationships where the contestants uh, are hardly know each other and yet aggressively are getting to know each other. And there are times when the contestants disappear behind closed doors and they don't show that on network television, what's happening behind those closed doors, but the strong indication is, the assumption is, the message is, they're having sex uh, on these TV shows behind the closed doors. And there's a variety of these shows out there, and, and it sells, and it plants a lot of poison in our hearts. A few years ago, this is, uh, I mentioned this back when the show was on. It's been a few years back. It's not that different than several that are on uh, right now. And the show was called Temptation Island. And I don't know how many of you remember Temptation Island. But it was a show, you get, two, you get a committed couple. There's a guy and a gal. You have a committed couple. They're not married yet. Some of them are engaged. Some of them just dating steady or they're living together. And so the committed couple... And they go to this uh, resort in an exotic location, and there are 13 other people on the Temptation Island. And over the course of the show, this couple, well, he dates the girls 
other girls on the island, and those dates are recorded. And then she goes and dates the other guys that are on the island, and those dates are recorded. And at the end of the show, they see how their committed partner managed in that environment of dates with other people. And, you know, it comes back, they're all making out. Some of them are having sex. And, and uh, it's, a cra- it's, it, it's, just, it's the reason that most of the traffic problems in Dallas are caused by uh, onlooker traffic. Like, it's not because your lane's even blocked. It's because you have to stop and see the carnage in the other lane, what happened in that wreck next on the other, going the other direction, like on 75. This is why people watch Tim, play shows like Temptation Island. You just love to see the wreck. Realize the dangers of sexual temptations. Realize what it does. Realize what it can do. Uh, just as uh, using the Temptation Island language, let me just encourage you, whatever age, whatever station of life, uh, don't plan, don't make plans to visit Temptation Island. How about that? I mean, don't book a flight to Temptation Island. D- don't, don't do, don't, don't stumble blindly toward danger. Don't Take someone you care about and love to Temptation Island. Don't wait until you're on Temptation Island to decide what is right and wrong. How about that? Whether or not you will sin against the person you love and sin against God. Don't fill your mind with poison like the content of a show like Temptation Island because uh, you're going to be tempted to play the home version of Temptation Island. And that's what it stirs. Realize the dangers. In the, in the context of the Ten Commandments, God took that commandment about adultery, dropped it right in the middle, because it's a big deal. Uh, and he did, God does not give us these commandments to limit our freedom or limit our fun or limit the joy that we have in life. He, put, he gave us commands because he loves us, cares for us, wants the best for us, and wants to help, help us avoid the devastation that comes with stepping outside of his plan. And... When sex outside of marriage takes place, it is destructive. And God loves us too much to lead us into that destruction. He wants to lead us away from it. He wants us to keep, protect us from Satan who, God loves us and Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy marriages. And he's having a heyday doing it. So in these sexual themes of things that we toy with, whether it is what we're viewing on the internet, what we're viewing on television, movies, all those things where we're seeing a lot of sexual content. Here's the weird part about the show is sometimes, well, in their hour time slot, it seems to have worked out. They did something crazy, but somehow it all worked out. So maybe it'll work out for me too. Man, that's just a dangerous road to go down. It's a slippery slope. The young man of Proverbs 5 was stumbling blindly forward and as uh, Solomon describes it, those of you who uh, you've ever had a pet snake, uh, you drop a little live white mouse into that cage with that pet snake, and you wait, and that mouse is just dumb as a stump, stumbling along in that stay in that cage, thinking everything is just grand, and then suddenly, snake destroys it. Uh, That's the image that we have. Realize the dangers. Uh, Second thing is to run from temptation. The writer of Proverbs says, keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Here's how Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians 6. Run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. The Bible says, don't, don't play with sexual temptations. Flee from sexual temptations. Leave no forwarding address. We think, uh, we can think of both positive and negative examples of this. With Eve, with, with just temptation in the Garden of Eden, she didn't avoid it. She took a look and she, at the fruit, and the Bible says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her. We don't blame Eve too much. Her dumb husband, Adam, was standing there with her when all this took place, and he ate. 
It's tempting to get a closer look at temptation. It is tempting to see how close can I get to the edge without falling over. And that's so often how we deal with sin. Not, instead of how far back can, can I go with this? How, how, how much protection can I put in to my life uh, in relationship to temptation? It's tempting to look uh, because Satan, Satan markets so well, especially with sexual temptation. It's going to be great. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. No one's ever going to know. And he doesn't say, and it's destructive, and it'll wreck your life, it'll wreck your relationships, it'll wreck your heart with God. Flee temptation. We see the example of Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph, son of Jacob. Joseph, he's, he's living, he's a slave, but working and managing a house for a guy named Potiphar, a significant Egyptian official, and uh, what happens with Joseph is that Potiphar's wife just takes a liking to him, and she seeks to seduce him when every opportunity is presented, when it would be so very easy, and uh, what does Joseph do? I'm not sinning against you, not sinning against Potiphar, not sinning against my God by doing this, and he runs the other way, even if it costs him his life. He ends up being thrown in prison because she still falsely accuses him. But he runs the other way. It's the right decision. We see David, King David, who at, uh, at the time of the year when kings go out to war, the Bible says, David stayed in Jerusalem. And he was walking up on the roof of his palace and he looked out and he saw a woman bathing on the rooftop. Every man's battle has this uh, strategy that when, uh, when you see the image, when you see the person, whatever it is, uh, you, you, don't, you don't follow the image. You bounce. You turn your head the other way. You could, bounce is the key. And uh, David did not bounce. And a glance became a stare, became a study. And suddenly, uh, Satan had him wrapped up and temptation became an action. It happens all the time. Channel surfing, but not surfing on to safety. Sin, when temptation becomes one mouse click, and then another, and then another. Run. Get away from the computer. Get away from, lay down that phone. Turn it off. Third thing. I have several things here. Don't step over the guardrails. The Bible warns, do not go near the door of her house. And it's a reminder, the door is a barrier. It's a reminder, there are barriers to this sin. There are things to, to it's, a barrier just says, it is, it is not safe beyond this point. Do not go past, some of you have been to Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, and there, there, there are rails that you say, you don't go, don't climb over the guardrails. There's always some nut that is going to try to take a selfie on the other side of the guardrail. And you just, something in you wants, <laughs> see if you can just, Go ahead and I don't know, push them on over the edge. Kind of a Darwin effect, you know, S uh, natural selection. Uh, there are guardrails for a reason. But again, how, not how close can I get to the guardrail, how far away from the guardrail can I position myself? So here's some things about guardrails and creating as many as possible. And this is one of my favorites for all, all things of this topic. Am I avoiding every appearance of evil? This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians. Abstain from all appearance of evil. It's not abstain from all evil. All appearance of evil. And that's an awesome guardrail. Because the guardrail is not just, well, you know, I know I'm not doing anything wrong. I haven't really, I haven't really stepped over the edge. But if someone who didn't even know you really well just happened to see you in a circumstance... What might they think? And if you, what might they think in their wildest imagination? Can, can you create a thing so that even, they, they couldn't even say maybe based on your behavior. And it's all those things of, you know, we have, we have a staff integrity agreement. I think it's on the website uh, that, that we use. It's the Billy Graham rules. Mike Pence has taken a beating for following Billy Graham rules uh, in how he deals with women. But... Man, praise the Lord for a man with sexual integrity. 
uh, in our country. Uh, and so he's often criticized and made fun of for it, but you know, just things like, you know, I'm not going to ride in a car with a, a woman who is not my wife, not my daughter, by myself. Uh, we go to staff lunch, our, our ministry staff, our senior staff, on Mondays, most Mondays. And we have two women on our staff. And so we have to mix and match to make sure all that works. But one of us is, you know, we've got to go to a hospital. And one of the ladies on our staff needs to make the same visit I need to make. We have to find somebody else to go with us. Because we just don't do that. We don't meet. I've had women who said, oh, I have this crisis in my life. Can you meet me at the church at 7 at night? I said, well, not unless I can find somebody who's willing to work overtime. If it's really a crisis, you'll come during business hours when there are people in the building because I don't do that. Uh, because I love the Lord and I love my wife too much for that. And so it's, it's those kinds of rules that you... Uh, You just, don't, you just don't step over. And so uh, avoid the appearance of evil. Am I praying for protection from temptations of the world, the flesh, the devil? And again, uh, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evils in the model prayer. Jesus said, watch and pray. This is talking to Peter. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Man, when it comes to sexual temptation, uh, most people say, yeah, I know what's right. But our weakness is readily apparent. Uh, am I refusing to go to places of temptation? Don't go near her door. And that's, you find where the triggers are, where this, where this sin continues to happen, where, the, where you just keep stepping over the edge. And you step back from that. And if that's a place online, if it, where, whatever it is, you step back from, from those lines. Cut off every relationship that is a source of temptation. Uh, Joseph ran from, avoided the woman who would be his temptation. Uh, back to Billy Graham rules kind of stuff. I, I know that the workplace is a complicated place in 2018 in these United States of America. Men and women working together, traveling together, all, all those kind of things that, that are, they're called on to do. And, but I remember... I remember it was uh, 20 years ago, staff lunch on Monday. We walked into a restaurant, and there's a guy, and they're long gone. Guy I knew, he's having lunch by himself with a woman that was not his wife. And they were just chumming it up at lunch, you know. Co-workers, a uh, major, major company here in north, north of Dallas, and he came over to our table because he knew we saw him. And yeah, we worked together and we're just... It wasn't two months later that he left his wife for her. It was all already in play. You just don't do those things. Well, but it's good for business. You're the vice president of the United States. Don't you value women? Not as much as I value my relationship to God, my relationship to my wife. And so you, you just don't... Don't follow those relationships. Work, workplace affairs are at the top of the affair-producing list. Uh, am I taking the steps necessary to ensure that I will not commit sexual sin when alone on trips? And that's tough. On, you know, so again, are you traveling with a woman? Are you uh, from work? Uh, are you, uh, and, and sometimes it's the internet, and sometimes it's movies, and all those things. Just build safeguards in. I know several, several men I've talked to who travel a lot said they go into that hotel room and they open up and, you know, you, you, you travel with a carry-on. You don't have a lot of weight there, but they'll reach into that carry-on and pull out pictures of their family and just build it around their TV so that it just creates uh, another safeguard. Fourth is listen to the right voices. In our passage in Proverbs, this guy makes all kinds of excuses, and it says he's listening to all the wrong voices. He's getting direction from a lot of different people. Instead of, my son, be attentive to my wisdom, says the wise man who loves God, but he's listening to a lot of other voices. And I have found people who love to listen to the advice of others about, well, you know, your marriage is having a little struggle. You know what would spice up your marriage? You watch some pornography. 
you know, sometimes just if you if in your marriage your husband isn't really exciting to you anymore, well, go find somebody else for a while, and that'll that's a people will take advice on sexual ethics from folks they would not take a recommendation on a good place to get a hamburger but they'll listen to them in relationship to big sweeping things that will so rock a relationship listen to people that you know are going to be in God's word be in God's house who uh, are going to be prayerful there are plenty of voices out there you're being bombarded by a media culture, and by a whole lot of people far from God who are going to tell you things that are just wrong before God. And I know there are a lot of voices out there that will help you justify sin in your mind, and sex outside of God's plan is okay because everyone's doing it. The Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Fifth thing, consider the consequences. This is verse 14. Uh, it tells us that this guy falls into temptation, comes to ruin, and his humiliation is public in front of the whole assembly. Man, you think sin's going to stay hidden? Sin does not stay hidden, not for long. It becomes known. And sin always has consequences. So I mean, just know that. Sin always has consequences certainly with God. But there are a lot of other consequences too. And one of the things we learn in the Bible is that when it comes to sexual sins, whatever they are, sexual sins across the board, the consequences are always more intense, more far-reaching, more devastating. Uh, that makes it more long-lasting. So here's, here's just a list. I'm going to run through these. Are you ready for the fact that your partner won't be able to trust you again for a long time? Or maybe you'll always be distrusted. Are you ready to sit down with your children of whatever age? I'm not talking about grade school kid children. I'm talking about folks having to sit down with their uh, very much adult children and explain, here's why I did what I did. Uh, and watch the hurt, the shock, the disbelief in their eyes. Are you ready for the threat of a sexually transmitted disease? There's your question to wrestle with. That's not a, seems to not be on the, radar of a lot of people anymore, but it's still so, so vivid in the real world. Are you ready for the emotionally ragged edges that are going to be left in your life when your spouse leaves you? Uh, what will you say to your parents? Uh, how will you do looking them in the eye? I mean, you're talking about you're an adult, talking to your aging parents, explaining the dumb decision you made. Are you ready to surrender the respect of your family, your friends, your co-workers? If you have an affair, you're ready for the explosive anger of the other side, uh, the, the family, the one with whom you had the affair? Can you handle the shame, the gossip, the criticism, the, the glances after a moral failure of people just knowing, people saying things, whispering the glances as you walk by? And what about the... Okay, so there's all of that. What about this? You're, you're the person that at work, hey, I know they're a Christian. They go to church. And they prayed for me in times of crisis. You know, this, in, our, in our outreach into the community, I'm amazed just in the, in the, not other people's stories, just my experience of talking to people in the community about church, about the Lord. How many of them know someone who's, yeah, they said they were a Christian, and here's what they did, and that's why I don't want any part of God. Man, the damage it does to your testimony to Jesus Christ, the damage it does to someone else's eternal soul when someone who claims to be a believer goes off the deep end in this area. And some of you have been waiting a long time for this this morning. This is the last point of the sermon. Remember God's perfect plan. Remember God's perfect plan. And I don't ever want to step away from this uh, you can probably write this down somewhere. The boundaries of sex are the boundaries of marriage. The boundaries of sexual expression in God's economy are the boundaries of the marriage relationship. Sex and marriage go together. The sexual, re sexual union is intended to be an expression of a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman 
under the authority of God for life. That's God's definition of marriage and sex happens. You draw a circle around that, that's where sex takes place. Outside of that, that's outside of God's plan. That's Matthew 19 where Jesus talks about that, gives it that definition. Apart from marriage, the lasting commitment is absent and the sex act becomes a false expression, a lie. It, it burns over a heart. It tears up lives. It's destructive always. Uh, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up a marriage. It's going to blow up a future marriage. As, you, as a single person, you, you, you step outside of God's plan. Sex is a privilege inseparable from the responsibilities of a sacred marriage covenant. Covenant marriage. We, we talked about that from Ephesians 5 a few weeks ago. Your sexual purity is essential to your walk with God, so don't make this a side issue. Sexual purity is not an option for someone who says, I belong to Jesus Christ. I have a committed relationship to him. Uh, we talk about God's will all the time. What's God's will? How do I know what God wants from me? What God would have me to do? Well, I can tell you this much. First Thessalonians says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would be holy as he is holy, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's God's will. Abstain from sexual immorality. And that First Thessalonians passage, sexual immorality is translating one very small Greek word, porneia. Now you hear that word, right? If you take the Greek letters, you put an English letter with it, that's transliterating, not translating. P-O-R-N-E-A, porneia. That's where we get our word pornography. And it is the word, the harshest word in the Greek language for sexual immorality, porneia. And in the Bible, it's defined over and over again like this. Draw the circle. Inside the circle, this is where sexual expression, under God's authority, a man and a woman committed to one another for life under the authority of God. That's where it takes place. Outside of that circle, Sexual expression of any kind outside that circle, that's porneia, sexual immorality. Now, sexual purity is inseparable from a committed Christian life. So here's what I'm going to say to you. There's some of you right now in your private life and it may be, uh, maybe it, it's, it's some guy, or it is some woman, or maybe it's on social media through Facebook or something where you have connected up with an old flame from high school, and we hear those stories so frighteningly often. Maybe it is online pornography. Maybe it's just fantasy thinking spurred on by romance novels or television or movies that you're consuming. But you know it's dangerous. You know it's an ugly line. And you feel the hot venom of Satan on the back of your neck in the midst of this journey. And you know you are in terrible, terrible danger. And your integrity, your integrity is your struggle with purity in private. This is a good day to say, I'm going to step away from being way too close to the edge. I haven't crossed the, maybe you haven't crossed the guardrail yet, but you're so crazy close to it. You, you, you're just, you're about to fall off. It's time today to look for God's forgiveness and turn from sin. He is gracious. He forgives. He cleanses. He restores. It's probably a good time to look at your guardrails. Reevaluate. How good are my guardrails? How well am I doing? Building around me this, uh, this as far back from the edge as possible so that I avoid even the appearance of evil. And if you're struggling with this, to find, uh, find some folks who are going to give you godly counsel and encouragement. Uh, somebody who will uh, meet with you for accountability,
prayer and just to change some patterns and create some new patterns because this road uh, is based on uh, going down some paths that are just dangerous paths and you need to change everything. And you want to do this? For your sake. For your family's sake. For your children's sake. For the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross to free you from sin. Uh, we do these things. So, sexual purity is key to relationship to Christ. Key to testimony key to reaching a lost world out there. And we need to do this well as God's people.